هلو ماماز حياكم الله في بودكاست رضاعة ولافندر الحلقة رقم عشرة Uh, hello, Mamas. This is uh, the first time we podcast in English, and our guest today is very, very uh, special. And I'm very honored for uh, him agreeing to do this. It's amazing. Um, Dr. Jack Newman started his uh, clinic, breastfeeding clinic, in 1984. And that was one year before I was born. So, and I think many of the moms in Kuwait are uh, like around that time. Uh, so, welcome, Dr. Jack Newman. Salam alaikum, and I'm very pleased to be here. Thank sort of. you. <laughs> yes, that's amazing how technology is getting everyone closer, and it's amazing that uh, we get uh, this chance. to be talking to you and getting from experience and it's just amazing and I'm so overwhelmed. <laughs> Me too. Awesome. Um, tell us about uh, what inspired you to support breastfeeding women? Well, uh, probably the same as uh, many people uh, uh, from our own family and uh, um, You know, my uh, my wife uh, breastfed very nicely uh, with a few little uh, problems, but uh, I saw how important it was and how the mother and the child and me too, you know, bonded together uh, with this whole uh, breastfeeding. Amazing. And then I went I went to work in Southern Africa, and I saw what people said was really true that uh, babies uh, die if they're not breastfed. Uh, in that uh, sort of situation, uh, but it occurs in uh, wealthy countries too, uh, that uh, babies get sick when they're not breastfed. So I worked in Southern Africa as a pediatrician for a year and a half, and when I returned to Canada, uh, I saw that uh, Canadian women were also having difficulties with breastfeeding, and so I started a clinic. I said, I can help them. And I guess that, I guess that was a bit of uh, 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 arrogance, I suppose, because I realize now, uh, 33 years later, that when I started, I didn't really know very much. <laughs> But I went in there and I, and I helped and I learned. And uh, I think I have a fair feeling for how breastfeeding works and how it should work. and uh, how I can help. That's amazing. We're so like happy with the help you've been giving to mothers in the world since that time till today and for many years to come, inshallah. Um, inshallah. And <laughs> you told us a story about um, the time you were giving a conference talk and uh, someone came to you and told you about breastfeeding that she thought that only animals do this. I think we are still living in a time um, where some people would still think the same. What do you think about this? Well, uh, that's interesting because uh, it's not it's maybe not only in uh, the Arab world, it's in North America and it's uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the breastfeeding uh, people in uh, in the United States by the name of Kathy Detweiler. She used to teach at the university and uh, Uh, she uh, uh, she tells the story of how her first year students in university wow. asked uh, how you know like they were surprised to find out what breasts were really for. It's it's uh, it's sad, but it's like surprising and and it still exists. Like as much as we have moved on from that, it still does happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell us about uh, how how starting up a breastfeeding clinic when it, I, was it one of its kind at the time? It was the yeah, it was the first in Canada. That's amazing. There was also one in uh, the United States in uh, San Diego at the time, but I didn't know that, and so I don't know. I, uh, I I I was working in the emergency department in urgent care at the hospital for sick children at the time, and. Uh, Uh, two of our pediatricians quit because they were uh, burnt out. And so we were told that uh, maybe we should uh, work less in the emergency and do something else. And I didn't know what I would wanted to do, but 
Uh, I saw so many mothers coming to the emergency department with breastfeeding difficulties. And so I said, okay, well, I'll start a clinic. And uh, that way I will work four hours a week uh, uh, helping mothers with breastfeeding. And uh, the rest of the time I'll work in emergency. But it sort of changed. Everything changed. I uh, I was getting more and more patients uh, c- wanting to come to the clinic, and I had to expand, and I ex- had to expand, and soon I didn't have any time to work in the emergency department. That's that's amazing. I'll, I'll keep saying this word over and over. <laughs> Always <laughs> like uh, it's it's beautiful how this support is getting to to women, and how it's like we didn't know that it was needed at at some point, and then. There was a very big need. It wasn't small. Um, I would also like to ask you, comparing that time and now, how how did it d- differ? How what is the change that is happening to breastfeeding women, like in terms of the difficulties that they had then in the eighties and now? I don't know if it's changed very much. I think that the. Uh, There are more women who are determined to breastfeed uh, that uh, don't take uh, uh, no for an answer. Uh, One of the most common emails I get is, uh, uh, you know, I've been put on such and such a medication and and I've been told I can't breastfeed. Is it true? And so mothers are not saying, oh, okay, whatever you say, doctor. Uh, they're uh, looking for uh, the right answer. And the right answer is almost always uh, that you can continue to breastfeed. So I think the real change has been in the mothers. Unfortunately, in the health professionals, I don't think it's changed. I think they are, uh, in general, I don't want to put everybody in the same uh, box, but I think in general, uh, most health professionals, and I'm including doctors and pediatricians and neonatologists, uh, actually don't know the first thing about breastfeeding. And they don't even know that they don't know and they're not interested in learning. And so the change has been in the mothers. The mothers want to breastfeed and they are right to want to breastfeed and they are right not to listen to uh, uh, misinformation from health professionals. Right, right. The, the education is the key. So as long as we keep educating women, then maybe do you think any time soon there will be change in, in the health care? Uh, maybe. If women, uh, if women uh, you know, fight enough, uh, but it's a shame that they have to fight for uh, continuing breastfeeding uh, or to get started with breastfeeding. The hospital uh, the hospital uh, procedures around uh, helping mothers uh, get off to a good start with breastfeeding, I can say in Toronto, are, are pitiful. They're terrible. Uh, they are so bad that I would say that any mother who succeeds at breastfeeding, uh, it's remarkable that she managed. Uh, it's not that so many mothers have difficulty. That's not the uh, surprising part. The surprising part is how many actually do well. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very rewarding for the mom, and and uh, it's very surprising when when people think, uh, oh, what does a lactation consultant do, or what does a breastfeeding counselor would do? Everyone can breastfeed, and then like it's surprising because if we go deep and ask that mom, maybe she did not breastfeed, and everyone assumes it's it's like la la la, and then everyone can do it, but it's not. Uh, the reality and it's just happening to moms here in Kuwait. Does it happen too in Canada? Oh, sure. Yes. All the time. We have a a diagnosis in our charts uh, for mothers who are having difficulty breastfeeding when they get particularly bad advice from uh, the nurses in the hospital, from the pediatricians, etc. We have a medical system failure. MSF, medical system failure. Sometimes we use another word with the F. And and how, like, what are the numbers regarding those? Oh, <laughs> almost every patient we see. So almost all the mothers have had bad advice uh, with very yeah. few uh, 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 exceptions. We now have a system of midwives, uh, privately working midwives in on t- in the province where I work, uh, and they are better. There's no question about it. But even they 
really haven't had enough education about how to help mothers, how to prevent problems and how to help mothers. If the babies are born at home, uh, as more and more are starting to be born at home, uh, I think maybe we're up to three or 4% of all babies are born at home now in Ontario. This is the province where I live. Uh, they, uh, you know, they usually get very good help, but in the hospitals in general, the help is appalling. And as I say, it's not surprising how many mothers have difficulty with breastfeeding. It's surprising how many actually do fine. Yes, we would like to greet and salute and celebrate with all those moms who are making it. Yay, mamas. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> uh, the podcast is, is somehow social and it's about like women relaxing and it, it's called in Arabic um, breastfeeding and lavender. And, uh -huh. and it's all about like... Let's relax. Let's just relax. And and, and I just had uh, to uh, quote uh, some of your sayings about like how the difference between women in, in Africa, uh, like not having troubles latching the baby on, a symmetric latch or, or a drawing or something to teach them about latching, yet they just do it. Uh, can you speak uh, about this uh, instinctual behavior of breastfeeding and the difference between how civilization can change it? Right. I think the main issue is that, uh, you know, in a year and a half that I worked in Southern Africa, oh, I don't know, we had an average of uh, a thousand uh, babies a month born every, well, every month. And, uh, you know, that I've never, never heard of any of the babies not latching on. Now, I think the difference is that uh, in uh, Western, and I mean, uh, you know, places like Kuwait as well, you know, affluent countries, uh, you know, so many mothers uh, give birth with an epidural and uh, intravenous fluids and so forth and so on. And I think that a lot of what happens to mothers and babies during the labor and the birth immediately afterwards is a result of uh, uh, these interventions with labor and birth that make breastfeeding, you know, not uh, natural and obvious. Uh, in other words, in order for breastfeeding to be natural, uh, you have to have a natural uh, childbirth. Now, I don't mean that we should never intervene with uh, childbirth, but if we uh, have mothers getting, you know, as a routine, getting intravenous fluids, epidurals, And in some places, I mean, there's some countries like Brazil where 70% of all babies are born by cesarean section. I mean, this is insane. Surely that can't be the best way to do things. And when we intervene in labor and birth like that, we doom a lot of mothers to not be able to breastfeed. Right. Can you speak and elaborate about... Um Epidurals, epidurals, and how they affect uh, mother's ability to breastfeed. Sure. Uh, one thing is that uh, when a mother gets an epidural, she also gets intravenous fluids, and in many places, a lot of intravenous fluids. Now, the reason that they do this is because when you have an epidural, the blood pressure can drop rapidly, and so they keep uh, this the fluid going so that the mother's blood pressure does not drop. But the thing is, is when the mothers get all this fluid, they get all swollen too, you know, their ankles, their fingers, and their breasts. And it means that the baby often cannot latch on very well because the, the breasts are all swollen. So the baby has difficulty latching on. And so then we've got a problem, the baby who doesn't feed or Also, the medications that are used in the epidurals are not uh, are, 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 are make the baby uh, sleepy. You mm -hmm. know, the anesthetist yeah. will say, well, it doesn't affect the baby. The, the, the anesthetists are wrong. There are lots of studies that show that the uh, drugs get into the mother's body, into her bloodstream, and from her bloodstream into the baby. And so uh, there was the remarkable thing I saw when I was in Southern Africa. And, And that is when the babies are born without an epidural or without medication, then the babies are wide awake and ready to go to the breast and they'll crawl to the breast and latch onto the breast without any problem. And if the baby is born with an epidural, or sorry, yeah, with an epidural, 
that often these babies are sleepy and floppy and they're not interested in the breast. And this is the beginning of all the problems because, you know, the, the, the nurses and the doctors say, oh, the baby has to eat, the baby has to eat, and they stuff a bottle of formula into the baby's mouth. And that's the next... Uh, the next uh yes yes i think it's um it's a very wide uh, usage of epidurals in, in in our area as well and uh, i once heard an, an ob say well no one is going to give um, a trophy to women who are going to birth without an epidural just take one and like just trying to tell women it's not worth it to do it and and go through labor naturally and how does the obstetrician know this? How, <laughs> exactly. is, is it a man? It's not a man, no, it's not. But no. probably a woman who is taught by a man, maybe. <laughs> yeah, probably. And, uh, you know, and chances are who didn't breastfeed herself. Yes. Of course, she's not talking about breastfeeding. But, yeah. it's, no, she's not uh, talking uh, from, uh, like, a point of an expert. She just thinks that since no one is giving a trophy for women who are naturally uh, laboring and, and birthing, then all women should take epidural. And this is a very like uh, common behavior when they, they want um, a, a quiet mom through labor, like mm -hmm. easy mom and, and things. Moms are told uh, it will be easier when you have an epidural. Then we ask, like, who is it easy for? Is it mom or is it the doctor and, and who gets paid for the epidural yeah yeah um and how do you th how do you think that effect how how can the effect go like because so, some women would say okay sleep your first few hours and then the baby will eventually wake up what can we tell those moms well the thing is it's not necessarily a few hours because uh, the baby is sleepy. The baby doesn't feed. When the baby doesn't feed, the baby is sleepy. And it goes on like that. And then, I don't know if you have this rule in uh, Kuwait, but in North America, in most hospitals, if the baby loses more than 10% of the birth weight, then everybody gets into a panic. And uh, what do we do? What do we do? You know, we give it. Well, they don't even ask. <laughs> they just say, okay, your baby needs formula. And the problem is, of course, when the mothers get all this IV fluid, the baby gets some of the IV fluid. So you have a baby who is overhydrated because they got all the fluid from the IV. Therefore, they start to lose weight because they, they pee a lot. They can't latch on because the mother is all swollen, her breast, and the baby is sleepy on top of it. And so you can just see where this is going. Uh, the formula, the bottles, the baby never gets to the breast, and the mother goes home with a baby who's never breastfed. Right, right. Can I ask you more about uh, what, in your practice, what is, what is the most like uh, harmful common practice that happens? Like, I think when you say um, Kuwait, Kuwait is exactly uh, as panicking when it comes to the 10%. Um, we are adapting the same healthcare system and routines. Model, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yes. I just agreed with you. Yes. Yeah. And okay, what is so the most I think harmful that, common practice? I think the harmful common practice, if I can narrow it one down to one thing, is that mothers do not get good help to latch the baby on. Because mm -hmm. breastfeeding is all about latching. I mean, if the baby's not latched on, the baby cannot la uh, cannot breastfeed. So we have a whole health system where nobody has learned how to help a mother latch the baby on. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, but uh, the vast majority of the health professionals have no idea that it, A, that it even makes a difference. You know, they say, oh, well, you know, you take part A and you take part B and you put part A to part B and there it is. That's all there is to breastfeeding. No, it's not. By the way. People say, oh, we all breastfed. And especially those uh, grandmothers saying we all breastfed. And then when you ask the grandmother, how long did you breastfeed or how did you breastfeed? Then we see the uh, old practices of giving a baby formula bottle during the night or uh, having a lot of pain. So, when, when she's in pain, her mom would just say, yeah, it's painful. Just suck it up. Just take it well and go.
go on. But it shouldn't be painful, and that's the and that's the truth. And I think that uh, if mothers got help with latching on, if mothers were taught was what, what a good latch was, then breastfeeding should not be painful. Right. Um, I'd like to uh, hear from you about tongue ties and lip ties. Okay, mamas, that's it for today's episode. Um, the answer to tongue ties question and many more questions will be in next week episode, um, episode number 11. And I'll see you then. Bye.